Welcome back to Motion Pick Recap. Today we're going to recap the drama movie, which is based on true events, titled, The Banker. Spoilers ahead. Watch out and take care. A man called Bernard Garrett is seen in Washington DC in 1965, and someone is heard telling him to be careful since they want to make an example out of him. As he is about to testify before a committee, we are suddenly taken back to Bernard's childhood in Willis, Texas in 1939. While working as a shoeshiner outside a bank, he listens to his customers' conversations about finance and real estate investing, takes notes of what he hears. While listening to a bank meeting one day, a police officer sees him and starts chasing him, yelling that his father will hear that he's spying on white people. That evening, Bernard's father talks to his son, telling him a stories of how young black men could be hanged for less when he himself was young. As he sees Bernard's notebook on finance, he says he is a smart kid, but that no white men will allow him to make money. Bernard however insists he will go out to make a lot of money one day. We are taken to Los Angeles in 1954, seeing Bernard arrive in a car with his wife Eunice and his son Bernard Jr., to visit his wife's uncle. The uncle tells Bernard that the aircraft company Northrop is hiring black men and that he can get a job there, but Bernard politely declines saying he will try his hand at real estate. His idea is to own property and rent out. The uncle starts laughing, saying he won't make it. Until they can afford their own house, the three rent a shed in Eunice's uncle's backyard, and Bernard is seen promising his wife he will get them a real home as soon as possible. The next day, while giving his cousin Tony a ride to his work, Tony apologizes for his father being rude to him the other night. A white boy called Matt, who's Tony's friend, is fascinated over Bernard owning a car, thinking he is rich, and asks Tony when Bernard is gone what he does, to which Tony answers that Bernard owns buildings. Next, Bernard is seen inspecting different properties and calling the owners to hear asking prices. A few days later, Bernard shows his wife a property in a white neighborhood that they can afford, but will have nothing left over to fix it up with. His wife has an idea and takes him to a potential co-investor called Joe, who she worked for before they were married. Bernard thinks Joe acts all too relaxed, non-serious, and like a playboy, and leaves without sharing his business idea, telling his wife he's not partnering with Joe. His wife is not happy since she thinks he got the wrong idea about Joe and wants Bernard to go in and talk again, but Bernard still doesn't like to partner with him. Bernard later meets with the owner of the property he can afford, whose name is Patrick, and asks Patrick to loan him $10,000 for renovations if he buys the building. Patrick responds that he doesn't make deals that way, and explains why, using some calculations and numbers. However, his numbers are slightly off, and Bernard quickly corrects him, which impresses Patrick since few have such know-how but still refused to give him a loan. While talking, Bernard notices a gift on a shelf behind Patrick, that Patrick has received from his banker, a man called Mr. Reed working at Mid-City Bank. Later, he drives to Mid-City Bank to talk with the banker. However, Mr. Reed isn't available to meet with him, and so Bernard waits outside the bank. As Mr. Reed leaves work, Bernard introduces himself, explaining he has a business idea that both he and Patrick would benefit from. Next, Bernard is back home in the shed, telling his wife downhearted that he failed to convince Mr. Reed. Suddenly Bernard receives a phone call, and it's Patrick on the other end, sounding serious and having heard Bernard went to his banker. He asks Bernard if he thinks what he did follows normal business customs, and Bernard answers somewhat hesitantly, that he doesn't think it does. Suddenly, Patrick changes his tone on his voice, sounding happy, and says he will do the deal since he likes people who don't follow normal business customs, like himself. When Bernard and his wife are at a nightclub a day later to celebrate, Bernard is suddenly approached by Joe, and the two talk a bit. Next day, Bernard and Tony are seen having started to renovate the property Bernard bought. A woman who lives there sees them and tells them they can't be there, but Bernard responds he owns the building and is allowed to do renovation work until 6 p.m. Upset, she comments that he is sassy, and that it's a white building, after which he enters her apartment. Next, Matt is seen arriving to help Tony and him to renovate, and Bernard asks if he's okay working for him, to which Matt answers he's worked for other men all his life. Bernard clarifies his question, asking if he is okay working for a black man, and Matt replies that the only color he is concerned about is that his money is green. They start renovating, but soon after, two officers arrive that tell Bernard a lady in the building called, saying he was impersonating the owner. Matt tries to defend Bernard, but the police hush him down. Bernard picks up papers proving his ownership, and the two policemen leave saying he should be more respectful to his tenants. As the old woman learns Bernard and his family are moving in as tenants too, she immediately moves out since she can't stand the presence of black people. Over the course of a few days, other somewhat wealthier black families move in, 
and in no time, the property is fully leased. Patrick sees Bernard's success and talent for real estate, and proposes a 50-50 partnership to buy up more rental properties. Bernard figures this allows him to expand quicker, since Patrick can pose as the front of the company, and so he happily accepts. The two work on and buy up finer and finer properties, getting help from Matt, Tony, and Bernard's wife with renovations and furniture. One day, Bernard brings his wife to a big mansion, asking her what type of furniture it needs, but quickly surprises her by saying it's their new home, and she gets overjoyed. A few months later, Patrick is found dead in his bed one morning. In a negotiation some time later, Patrick's wife offers Bernard 25% of all the buildings he and Patrick acquired together. Bernard thinks it is outrageous, but since his name doesn't appear on any papers, his only two options are either to take the 25%, or get nothing. Bernard goes to talk with Mr. Reed, to see if there is any chance he can help him, but Mr. Reed won't meet with him at all. Suddenly, Bernard gets an idea, seeing all the financial institutions renting space in the big banker's building he is in. He goes to talk to Joe, who he now has learned owns 18 rental properties of his own, and proposes they start a joint venture together. If they partner up, they could potentially buy the banker's building. That way, the 12 banks that rent space in it, will have to think twice before refusing them loans in the future. When they are not refused loans, they will be able to start buying up more properties in white-only neighborhoods and expand quicker. Joe laughs and thinks he's very audacious, but asks how anyone will want to sell their properties to them, since they're black. Next, they have invited Matt, asking him to be the front of their business venture. Matt says he knows nothing of business and is doubtful, even though the two offer to teach him everything they can. In a diner later that day, a waitress called Susie is seen mustering up the courage to go up to Matt sitting at a table, who she's interested in. She tells him she's a few years younger, but that everyone knew him from Hollywood High. She asks what he's pondering about, and he tells her it's about a new job. Matt explains the job is kind of a partnership in real estate investing, and she gets impressed. Matt's attitude immediately changes, and goes back to meet with Bernard and Joe again, saying he'll happily take the job. Joe tells him to be at the golf course at 6 a.m. next morning. To make a good impression on the bank property owner, Matt needs to learn golf, and so Joe teaches him. Simultaneously, Bernard gets to meet Joe's old trusted banker called Donald, who is willing to lend them a maximum of $2 million to purchase the bank property. Bernard tells Donald not to worry, since he plans to get it for less than that. Next, Bernard is seen teaching Matt real estate calculations. Over the course of several weeks, Matt is seen struggling, going from knowing nothing to something, and slowly improving on golf and math. Soon Matt gets a hang of it, and learns dining etiquette and gets a proper suit. One day, Matt performs calculations in his head while golfing like a professional, and they decide he's ready. They go over the banker's building deal together, and Bernard says they have arranged so that Matt will bump into the banker's building's owner, Charles Renault, at an exclusive golf club. As planned, Matt meets Charles a few days later, and he manages to impress Charles with his golf skills. The two schedule a meeting to negotiate a price for the banker's building, to potentially make a deal. A week later Matt is on his way to the meeting, and goes through his math training in his head. The meeting goes smooth, and Matt impresses Charles once again with his sharp knowledge of the real estate market and his quick calculations in his head, and they eventually agree on Matt getting the building for $1,560,000. They celebrate their purchase, after which they are seen getting good relationships with the bankers. They buy up more and more, and bigger and bigger fine properties in white-only neighborhoods. Matt is seen marrying Susie. Eventually, the trio are real estate moguls, ending up meeting the US vice president who came by the banker's building. A few years later, they visit Bernard's father in Willis, Texas, and his father expresses how proud he is of him. Bernard and his son Bernard Jr. are out walking the next day when Bernard sees the mainland bank, outside which he polished rich men's shoes many years earlier. Back in Los Angeles, Bernard tells Joe he wants to buy the bank in Texas. Joe says running a bank is very complex and out of their expertise, not in the least considering it's far away in Texas, where people in addition are even more opposed to black people running businesses. Bernard is however convinced they can buy it like they did with the banker's building, having Matt posing as a front. When Joe hears that there's a large untapped market since black people right now are not allowed to borrow money from the bank, he agrees to be a partner, even though he's somewhat reluctant. Some time later, with the help of Joe's banker Donald, Matt is able to buy the mainland bank for Bernard and Joe, with the previous owner and his son Florence still having a 20% interest in the bank. They immediately begin to discreetly let responsible black people borrow, doubling the loans they accept. Thanks to this, some black families can afford nicer homes, 
and some black businessmen are able to increase their businesses' revenues. Three months pass like this, but then suddenly the previous owner's son Florence, who's an executive in the bank, finds out they are lending to black people. He confronts them one day, saying if people learn they are lending to black people, there might be a run on the bank. They ask him how anyone would find out, and Florence picks up a paper showing the US Treasury Department will do an inspection in one month, having received anonymous reports they are making too many unsafe loans. Later, Matt shares an idea with Joe and Bernard to solve the situation. He explains they can buy another small bank which he personally can run himself, and then they can do some financial tricks to divide the loans they have made between the two banks. That way, there's a much smaller risk the government will close them down for having provided too many loans. Joe and Bernard think it's a bad idea since he only have three months of banking experience. Matt then says he is very grateful for all that they have taught him, but that he will stop helping them if he doesn't get the opportunity to become a partner and owner too. Seemingly being in a difficult situation, Joe and Bernard agree. Matt buys and becomes an owner in their newly acquired bank, called the Marlin Bank. After a few days, they begin fixing their finances like plan to lessen their risks. A day or so later, Florence calls Matt, saying some white people want to withdraw all their money from mainland bank, thinking the bank is owned by black people from the NAACP. Bernard and Joe later learn five white people withdrew all their money, and nine were convinced by Florence to stay. One morning, a federal bank examiner comes to Marlin Bank, telling Matt he will come back in one hour to go through the master books. Matt immediately calls Bernard and explains the situation. Bernard tells his wife that Matt is in trouble, and that he himself will need to be in the meeting with the examiner to prevent Matt from screwing up, which is impossible. Eunice proposes he dress like a cleaner to help Matt from outside the meeting room. But he says he won't do that, to which Eunice comments she has done it many times to help their business. Bernard says she's a woman, which is different. She gets angry, saying she still loves him, but that he do not behave much better than white racist people if he is going to make differences between men and women. Persuaded by his wife's words, Bernard is then seen cleaning as Matt and the examiner meet. Bernard begins to help Matt like planned, but the examiner closes the door since they are talking about confidential information. Bernard can no longer hear or help Matt and walks away. Matt starts getting in trouble and excuses himself to check some files, walking out to Joe, Bernard and Eunice to get some help. They give him some advice, but to no avail, since the examiner finds several bad loans on their books. Afterwards, the trio discuss, and Joe and Bernard will have to put up $300,000 of their own money to cover the bank's bad loans. Matt feels bad having caused Joe and Bernard to lose $300,000. A few days later, Joe gets a call from his lawyer Donald, who tells him Mainland Bank has bought $300,000 of bad debt for Marlin Bank. Joe is shocked to hear the news, and him and Bernard quickly drive to Mainland Bank and rushes in, asking Matt angrily what he is doing since buying bad loans is fraud. Matt says he thought he could fix things temporarily, and Bernard asks him to bring out the books immediately to fix it. But at that same second, federal people arrive, announcing the Treasury Department has revoked Mainland's license to do banking. They fire Matt, tell the people inside the bank that it is closed until further notice, and instruct everyone that they must leave. As soon as they get outside, the FBI arrests Joe and Bernard. Some time later in Washington, D.C., a lawyer tells Joe and Bernard that state banking charges against them have all been dropped, but that federal charges are still in place. He mentions that, as it happens, a senator in Arkansas is holding hearings about something called lax rules in banking, which concerns Joe's and Bernard's charges. If they make points on that, they could make this political, which would force the federal charges to also be dropped. Simultaneously somewhere else, Matt is in trouble for having handled the situation with the bank in a fraudulent way, and is told he can either accept going to prison, or explain in court that it was all Joe and Bernard's fault and he would go free. Later at home, Matt thinks it over, and makes a phone call to someone. Someday later, Matt testifies in court that Joe and Bernard employed him, manipulated him, and instructed him how to handle the loans and money transfers. After the testimony, Bernard is given two choices. Either he takes the immunity deal and confirms what Matt said, that he took advantage of lax rules to enrich himself, which would allow Congress to fix those rules, and he would walk a free man. Or he can refuse and say whatever he wants, and his statement will be compared to the testimonies of a lot of white people, and if the court decides he's lying, he will go to prison. Afterwards, Bernard is taking a stroll outside with Eunice, and she remarks how beautiful the buildings are. Bernard says it probably was too early for two black people to own a bank in Texas, but his wife tells him it might have just been the right time, since it shines a bright light at these issues. Bernard says that, if he mentions the problem that many black people are still excluded from the American dream in his testimony, 
he might lose his immunity deal. He asks Eunice what he should do and she tells him that, whatever he decides to do, she will stand beside him and support him. Just before Bernard will enter to testify, he talks with Joe, and the two think back at the years they have been in business together, leading up to this moment. They share some friendly jokes and comments, after which Bernard enters the courtroom. In the testimony, Bernard states that the nation's founding documents declare that all men are created equal, which is a noble goal that hasn't been achieved yet. While being constantly warned he will lose his immunity, Bernard stands up and continues saying that, if a man can't get a loan, he can't start a business and build wealth or buy a home, and is as such excluded from the American dream. Finally he asks the rhetorical question, how can so many black people just be excluded from the American dream? Joe and Bernard were sentenced three years in prison, and the federal government seized all of their assets, including all their 177 owned buildings, and their personal fortunes. In the final scenes, Bernard is seen getting out of prison, being met by Joe and his wife. He tells Eunice they should go home, and she gets confused, saying they don't have any. Bernard then reveals a secret. The day before Matt testified, Matt called him up and told him he was facing 50 years in prison if he didn't blame Joe and himself for everything. He told Matt to do what he had to do, but since the government hadn't taken their fortunes yet, he asked Matt for a favor, to buy two houses for him and Joe in the Bahamas. Hearing these news, Eunice gets overjoyed. Three years after their testimonies, the Congress passed the Fair Housing Act of 1968, finally ending these long-lasting racial issues to buy and rent property. The end. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe if you'd like to see more videos like this, and hit the like button to help us out. Until next time, take care.